Hello there. In December of last year, the UK government launched a scheme designed to raise awareness for the surging popularity of new electric cars. The idea? A little green square in the corner of the number plate of all new EVs. And it was a hit. In fact, it was so popular that I know people that had green square number plates retrofitted to their electric cars that they'd bought before the scheme came in so that they could proudly display their emissionlessness. But what if you want your car to be visibly green from a distance, like a big distance, like from the moon? Well, you get one of these, don't you? This, this is the Vauxhall Mocha E and it's ever so green. But is it any good? Well, we've actually had quite a long time to decide because we've had this on long-term loan and it served as a crew car during that time. Just about every member of the fully charged production team has driven this and we've put it through just about everything you can Put a car through and we can now say with absolute confidence that it's it's pretty good allow me to explain but before I do please be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment down below because it really helps the channel grow even if that comment just says green this is the Vauxhall Mocha E and this is fully charged yes it's the great EV giveaway don't forget to subscribe and enter for your chance to win all sorts of prizes including one of four electric cars. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of the Vauxhall Mocha E, a little bit of backstory on Vauxhall, because it's important to know that right now Vauxhall is trying its best to have a Kia Hyundai moment, which is to say they're trying to reinvent their brand. I think it would be fair to say that Vauxhall have been slightly lagging behind their competition for a little while now, and they want to fix that. And they've done two things to try and fix that. Number one, dramatic design language rethink, as you can see on this car, and we'll get to that in a second. But number two, they've joined forces with a big group of other car brands who are also slightly struggling at the moment and they've formed a super group in order to pool resources and ideas. The group in question is called Stellantis and it is comprised of, to name just a few, Citroen, Peugeot, Opel Vauxhall, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Maserati, some serious names. And you can think of Stellantis as like the automotive McBusted in that they have a terrible name. Stellantis, it sounds like something you catch. Oh, what happened to your eye, mate? Oh, bloody went for a wee, forgot to wash my hands, rubbed my face, now I've got Stellantis. Anyway, the upshot of this part-sharing supergroup type situation is that underneath the body, the Mockery is running the same battery, motor, and many other bits as other Stellantis Group EVs, like the Citroen EC4, like the Peugeot E2008. Regrettably, that platform is not dedicated EV architecture. Stellantis calls it a multi-energy platform, which is to say it was designed with both petrol, diesel, and EV variants in mind, because of course you can have the Mocha as any of those three. We'll get into that in a second, but for now, let's have a chat about this car's angry face. Right, let's have a chat about this design because, well, there's a lot of design going on here. This is completely different looking to any Vauxhall Opal that we've ever seen before, and that's a really good thing. We've got to start with this. This is called the visor, this kind of letterbox design with the headlights enclosed. It's a, it's a homage to the old Opal Manta for you car nerds out there. And we're going to see this across all future Vauxhalls. This is part of their new design language. I've said in the past that this car, especially in this green, looks a bit like a squashed muscle car. You see it? Like a muscle car that kind of got shrunk in the washing machine. I think it's kind of cute. And I like this as well. We see bonnet bulges all the time, but this single one down the middle, like a kind of mohawk, I like it. And I like the way it looks when you're driving and you're looking out across the bonnet as well. Oh, 
I can't tell you how nice it is to just be driving a small car again. I love small cars. I feel like I'm developing a reputation on this channel for only having an interest in really big, expensive stuff. Not so. I adore a small, simple car that just gets the job done. And particularly driving around London, where I am, it's so stressful driving a big car in a city. Where I live in Hackney, there's lots of these little narrow gates and they're about 2.1 meters wide. Well, the Audi e-tron GT, when I had that, was two meters wide. Not relaxing. And let me tell you, this car, it's a delight to drive around a city. It's comfortable, it's nice and squashy. I've got lots of suspension travel, big, high-profile tires on this one, and just really, really, really simple. Vauxhall has clearly pitched this car at people who don't want their EV to be too confusing to other. And as such, look, it's just a car. Steering wheel, pedals. There's no flappy paddles to adjust my regen strength, just a B button down here. Regen on or regen off, you don't need settings, says Vauxhall. There's very little in the way of customizability here. Again, to keep things simple, I do have three drive modes. I've got normal, sport and eco, but as far as I can tell, all they really do is slightly affect how much power you get. You get about 100 horsepower in normal, the full 130 something in sport, and a few less in eco to save battery. But I tend to just leave it in normal. Eco is really for when you're trying to get home and you're not sure you're gonna make it and your bum's all clenched. The sport button is pointless as far as I'm concerned. This is not a sporty car. All it does is make it a bit punchier, but it doesn't sharpen anything else up. And it does like to roll around a bit in the corners of this car. I just don't think sportiness is a word that's in its vocabulary and I find myself leaving it in normal mode all the time. And typically this is around the point of the video where I do my customary whinging about crossover SUVs and how ridiculous they are. I'm not gonna do it today, partly because I've probably done it enough at this point, but also because, well, Vauxhall has the Corsari. There is a hatchback alternative if you want it. Love that. That's the one I'd have, by the way, obviously. Coming around the side of the car, well, let's talk about this two-tone paint job. Quite nifty, isn't it? I think the green is reserved only for the electric mocker because, of course, this is uh, available as a petrol and diesel car as well. The green paint, that's electric only. Also, the little E, you get a little E if you get the electric one. I like these wheels, 17 inch, you can get bigger ones, but I would stick with these because they look really nice and it rides really nicely on these big squashy tires as well. Around the side, floating C pillar. Ooh, look. It's floating. This is a, another Vauxhall design cue that we see on quite a lot of their products. It's gonna feature on lots more going forward as well. And around the back, it's just tidy, isn't it? Tidy, I like these slim tail lights. I like the way it's proportioned. It's got a nice stance on it. It's a little bit sporty, a little bit muscular. It's just so much better looking than old Vauxhalls. Do yourself a favor, Google the old Vauxhall mocker Hold up a picture of it and then look at this and you'll understand how much of a step forward this is. The old Vauxhall Mocha is so boring, I once forgot what it looked like while staring at a picture of it. So we're in the office today for a big company-wide meeting and what I thought I'd do is interview some of our crew, read the Mocha, because most of them have had a go in it. And I thought A, it'd be good to get some normal people's takes on it, B, uh, they're all really camera shy, and I find it very funny putting cameras in their faces. Jesse. Jesse. <laughs> Come on, Jesse, old buddy, old pal, talk to me. Come on, Jesse. Okay, mockery. Um, I'm going to say I like this car. Uh -huh. I could feel my street cred draining, whatever I had left draining out of me as I started driving it, but I really like the car. The handling was great, I felt safe in it, and when I picked my mum up, she said it was lovely. Do you not like the way it looks then? I didn't to begin with, and then I, it actually grew on me. Nice. I say. Thanks, buddy. It's all right. Wasn't so bad, was it? Louis. Louis. <laughs> Mockery, quick, go. <laughs> nice, tidy car. Struggles a bit on the long range, mm. but apart from that, perfect. Perfect? Yeah, perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Wow, it's a gleaming review. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And it's green, so. In every sense of the word. Yeah, in every aspect. Hello. Hello. You've got the mock of this week, don't you? I have. What do you think about it? Uh, it's a good car. It's a good all-round car. A bit small on the inside. Um, 
I like the driving position, it's quite good. You can very got a lot of visibility, you can see the bonnet quite clearly. Ooh, yeah. Um and the colour's quite cool. George! George. Mockery, what do you think? Mockery's really good, like it. Um it's a great car for driving around the city. Uh so easy to drive. Anything you don't like? Motorway range. Falls yeah. off the cliff, doesn't it? Yeah, it like really declines rapidly. City car, lovely. Perfect. Cheers. And welcome to the inside of the Vauxhall Mocha E. Do you know what? I've spent a few weeks with this car now and this interior, I think it's really impressive. It's sensible, it's practical, it's all the things that a small, semi-affordable family car should be, but it's also a bit nice. A few little details in here just to differentiate it from the other intensely boring crossover family cars. Let's start off with the sensible stuff first. This is the steering wheel. Not much to speak of that there. Climate control here, controls here. I really like these little rubberized flicky buttons. This one is for the speed of the cruise control, and this one is for my volume. Just They're just nice. They just feel nice to press. And then we've got this here, this kind of letterbox design, which reflects the visor at the front of the car. That houses the two screens. Digital gauge cluster, really nice design on it. I like how clean it is, and I like the simplicity, and I like the font that they've gone with. It's just, it's just a bit nice. And then this one in the middle here, this obviously serves the infotainment system. But does anyone use infotainment system on cars anymore? Is there even any point in reviewing them? Because Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, that's what we do. That's all we use. And it's seamlessly integrated in this car. The touchscreen is pretty responsive. Everything works really nicely. It's just very easy to live with, this cabin. Physical buttons where you'd want them. Everything is where you expect it to be. But again, a couple of little nice things as well. Like this gear selector, ooh, isn't that nice? It looks really nice as well and it feels good. A couple of less good things, fingerprinting material here. I've whinged about that before and I'll whinge about it again. Don't know why you'd put that on a car, especially a family car because children, sticky, messy. This is a weird one. This took me a couple of weeks to realize. There's no grab handle up here. There's not one over there. How is my mother supposed to express her displeasure at my driving if she can't? passive aggressively grab onto something. Bit of a shame. Um, this glove box, comedically small. These are the kind of intimate details that you get in a long-term review like this. Why, why is that so small? Why? Don't know. Overall, I would say that this cabin smokes the VW ID3's cabin. I really do think that because, well, it doesn't look as clean and space age and minimalistic, but it's just nicer to use. All the buttons work properly. You don't have to stroke anything to make your air con colder. It's, it's just very sensible, but a bit nice at the same time. But there is one area where this cabin lets itself down and it's, well, sort of this area here because I am quite tall, unusually tall as we know, but I can't help but feel that even a, even a small to medium sized human adult is gonna, uh, <laughs> it's gonna be quite unhappy back here. It's, there's no room at all. Now, here's the thing, back in the ICE days, we used to just accept that small cars had very small rear seats and small boots like this one does. But in the days of EV, we don't have to deal with this anymore. The VW ID3, which is built on proper EV architecture, is about 10 centimeters longer than this car. But in the cabin, it's got roughly 9,000 times more space. Now, let's have a chat about this car's underbits. As I mentioned before, this is a Stellantis product and it shares much of its componentry with the Citroen EC4 and the Peugeot E2008, etc. So that means we've got a front wheel drive single motor setup which has about 134 brake horsepower. We've got a 45 kilowatt hour usable battery, and that results in circa 150 miles of real world range. That range will. One thing I really do need to have a big whinge about is this car's range prediction. That is a problem because as soon as you take this thing on the motorway, its range just falls off a cliff. It's not good at guessing how many miles you're gonna get out of your remaining battery. That's a problem. 
I drove here from London today to Bristol. It's about 110 miles. And when I left my house, I had about 65 miles of cushion. That is to say I had, you know, 175 miles of range for a 110 mile journey. When I arrived in Bristol, I had about 15 miles of range left. I had lost 50 miles of range into thin air. And I wasn't driving like a Wally. I was just doing motorway speed. This car is overly optimistic with its range prediction. I think it always thinks it's in a city doing stoppy, starty, regen braking city driving. And it just doesn't really know what's going on when you take it out on the motorway. And that's a problem. Because in a car like this that is so clearly designed for people that don't want EVs to be intimidating or confusing, that's a one-way ticket to range anxiety. You don't want an optimistic EV. You want optimistic people in your life, but you want EVs to be pessimistic. You want them to be down to earth and pragmatic with their range estimations. And this car just isn't. Concluding thoughts on the Mocha E, B plus. I think this is a B plus car. It's not a Kia EV6. This is not the car that we'll look back on as the vehicle that transformed Vauxhall forever, but it is a huge step in the right direction. And don't get me wrong, if you are looking for a small, practical, electric family car that doesn't shout too much about its electricness, but equally doesn't make you look like a saddo who's given up on life at the school gates, this may well be the car for you. But I think personally, I have to recommend the less cool but far more practical ID3 over this car. Because compared to the VW, the cabin space is not good in this car. The range is a bit underwhelming and that range prediction issue really is gonna wind you up if you're planning on doing any motorway driving ever in this car. Well now, final thoughts on the mockery. Oh, I'm gonna miss this car. It served us so well as a little crew car for the last few months. And personally, it's just been so nice to drive something that's small-ish and cheap-ish. I feel like I've had a string of quite posh, large electric cars on test recently. I know, poor me. And this has been really refreshing. I forgot how much I love small cars that just get the job done. And I think I would describe this car, and in fact the whole first generation of Stellantis EVs, the Corsa E, the EC4, the E2008, I would summarise them all as a really good first effort. I really like the whole part sharing thing that Stellantis are doing. I'm impressed by how well they've managed to distinguish their cars from one another, despite all the part sharing via their design and their cabins and the way that they drive. It's all looking good for the automotive muck busted and I can't wait to see what happens with these brands in the next few years. As for Vauxhall, well, they've definitely succeeded in sexing their brand up a little bit. I think this is one of the best looking Vauxhall cars in recent memory. Now I just want to see this design matched with really good hardware and slightly cleverer software. I want to see a Vauxhall that looks this good built onto proper EV architecture and I want to see models underneath it that are smaller and cheaper. And the good news is all of these things are coming because Stellantis have already told us they're, they're spending 30 billion euros building four different BEV platforms which will span everything from tiny economy cars to big brawny muscle cars. It's happening. Very exciting. In the meantime, the Mocha E. A charming little electric crossover, just not the one I'd pick. Please make sure to like and subscribe and if you have been, thank you for watching. Well, if you enjoyed that episode, you're going to love this one. And this one, too, is very relevant to the topic. And also, if you want to subscribe to Fully Charged, which is a wonderful thing to do, really helps us, costs you nothing, you just click up there. It's really simple. And if you do want to support us a little bit more, you can have a look at the Patreon link. That's up there. Thank you.